Hello Year 4 and this is today's reading lesson on Friday the 29th of January. So once again we are going to be adding to our learning journal. Um, and we're going to read chapter 10, 11 and 12. So just a very quick recap. So the, um, the Bombsteads, they ended up somehow managing to get on the aeroplane to Brazil. Unfortunately for them, Fintan Fedora wasn't there because they decided to go on a cruise, which resulted in a, an American guy who was in charge of a big confectionery, um, was it biscuits industry, uh, Max Wrench. He ended up being accidentally thrown overboard the ship. Um, Finton thought it was his dear butler Gribbley that had fallen overboard so he uh, there was a mass panic trying to save somebody but they realised that he hadn't gone overboard unbeknown to them that actually Max Wrench the American he had gone overboard so let's find out what happens next so chapter 10 well what a stupid idea that was, snarled and exhausted Edith Bumstead as she trudged out of the airport into the darkness of a Brazilian evening. Let's disguise ourselves as cabin crew, says my criminal mastermind son. We can ask the boy for his passport. Brilliant. And what did we get? Eleven hours of serving tea and having to be nice to people. That's what. Don't you think I'm going to don't you think I'm going to forget this in a hurry, young man? Because I won't. Oh, shut up moaning, will you, snapped Eric, who wasn't feeling particularly cheerful either. It's not my fault they weren't on the plane, is it? All I know is the boy's obviously a lot cleverer than we thought. Feeling extremely sorry for themselves, the failed kidnappers slouched over to a wooden bench just outside the airport and slumped miserably onto it. The fact that they had just got a free ride to one of the most beautiful and exciting locations in the world didn't even occur to them. They weren't in the mood for looking on the bright side. The memory of being outsmarted by some horrible, spoilt little kid was still far too painful to allow them any happy thoughts. So was the even more recent memory of being exposed as fake cabin crew, sacked for gross incompetence and unceremoniously thrown off the plane as soon as it hit the tarmac. And we didn't even get paid, said Edith bitterly. What a cheek! Eric nodded in mute agreement and scuffled his feet around in the dust. Several minutes passed in awkward silence, broken only by the occasional sigh and Edith removing her smelly trainers to rub her aching feet. So what are we supposed to do now, Mr Clever Clogs? she said eventually. We've got no money, no food, no passports and we don't speak, uh, whatever language it is they speak here. Eric attempted to pull a face which would make him look less, which would make him look less stupid. Don't you worry, Mum. That Finton Fedora may be clever, but he's not clever enough to get the better of me. I'm working on a new plan already. He paused a while for effect, then announced, I reckon we should wait right here. We should do a stakeout. Unsurprisingly, Edith was unimpressed, which, with this new plan, she sneered and made a noise like a horse exhaling. exhaling. <laughs> no, listen, continued Eric. They're bound to be on the next flight, aren't they? They reckon they've given us the slip. But that's where they're wrong. They won't be expecting us to be waiting around, around for them here. Neither Eric nor Edith thought this was much of a plan, but it did at least mean they wouldn't have to do anything for a while, which was a good enough reason for Edith going along with it. Four hours passed and night fell. Crickets chirped noisily in the bushes. Every now and then, a small cluster of people emerged from the airport and headed to the car park and got into a waiting cab. None of them were Finton Fedora. I'm hungry, announced Eric after a few more hours of sitting in the dark. He rummaged through his pockets, found a couple of stale bread rolls he'd stolen from the in-flight catering trolley and bit raven ravenously into one. Give us some, said his mother, still rubbing her stinky old feet. What? Why should I? moaned Eric, spraying her with little crumbs of little lumps of flaky crust. You should have got your own like I did. 
You selfish little pig, hollered Edith, whose temper had been getting steadily worse for some time. Eric stuffed his mouth even fuller and clutched both rolls protectively to his chest. Forward planning, mother, forward planning, he spluttered. I can't help it if you're too thick to plan ahead, can I? He would probably have said more, but at that point his mother's bony old fist hit him squarely in the face. He fell off the bench and coughed a huge mouthful of damp bread onto the ground. Selfish, that's what you are, continued Edith furiously, leaping onto his back and rubbing his face into the dusty ground. Totally selfish. Eric rolled over, bucking like a horse, and knocked his mother head first into the bench. Her glasses flew off into the bushes. Oh yeah, selfish am I, he yelled while trying to get his mother in a stranglehold. Well, at least I'm not thick like you. For the next few minutes, mother and son traded insults and swung their fists at each other. Eventually, when they were both too exhausted to fight any more, they sat miserably at either end of the bench, picking at what was left of the bread rolls, nursing their black eyes and dabbing at their nosebleeds with grubby hankies. Dawn began to break and the air temperature began to rise. Still, there was no sign of Finton. So how much longer are we going to wait here? Ventured Edith, finally breaking the unpleasant silence between them. Eric shrugged his shoulders sulkily and said nothing, preoccupied with a loose toff he'd just, toss he'd just di discovered. An hour later, the heat and the boredom became unbearable. Reluctantly, they got up and began trudging along the dusty road towards the nearest town. Chapter 11 The Magnifico sailed grandly into port in blazing South American sunshine. Looks like we made it then, Gribbs old man, beamed Finton, as he crammed his rucksack with a new stock of peanut butter sandwiches he'd had made up, just in case they didn't have them in Brazil. One step closer to the chocker plum, eh? Gribbly was still unconvinced of this, but he agreed anyway, out of politeness. Once the ship had docked, the passengers began to disembark in, a, in a, an excited throng, weighed down with suitcases, brightly coloured sun hats and noisy children. Amongst the crowd, an anxious-looking American woman with over, oversized sunglasses was rushing around asking everyone whether they might have seen her missing husband. No one had. Gribbly walked ashore, pushing their large trolley load of luggage and looking hugely relieved to be back on dry land. Even more relieved to be on dry land. However, was Max Wrench? Exhausted, wrinkled as a prune and covered in seaweed, he emerged from the sea and hauled himself onto the quayside. He lay there, face down for a while, trying to find the strength to stand. Are you all right, sir? inquired one of the white uniformed crewmen, gazing down at his horribly sunburnt bald head. Wrench opened one eye and looked absolutely f furious. No, I'm not all right, he croaked. The man was just helping him to his feet when Barbara Wrench spotted him and came rushing over. Where on earth have you been hiding? she demanded. Do you know how I've how ill I've been for the past few days, do you? I've just had to suffer the worst days of my life holed up in that rotten excuse for a ship. Max tried to interrupt her flow of angry accusations, but was feeling too weak. I have been so sick, Max, she continued. So sick you wouldn't believe. And where, where were you, huh? Where were you? You were there to hold my hand and keep me company like any decent husband. Oh no, you were nowhere to be seen. Probably in the bar with your pals or in that restaurant stuffing your with fancy food, not one shred of sympathy for your poor suffering wife, who... Shut up, Barbara, rasped Wrench, his eyes bulging like a madman. Not now, okay? Not now. Give me your phone. I need to make an urgent call. Barbara was shocked into silence for a moment, but it wasn't long before she found her voice again. How dare you talk to me like that, she shrieked. You are the rudest, nastiest, most selfish man. Ignoring his wife, wife's continuing list of his failings, he grabbed her handbag, rifled through it and pulled out her mobile phone. Max poked clumsis, clumsily at the keypad with his numb, wrinkled fingers and was relieved to get straight through to his boss in New York. Randall, it's Ranch, he said hurriedly in a voice made croaky from three days and nights in the sea, shouting for help. Now listen, this is important. 
I'm not fooling around here. You know that dumb kid I was talking about? Well, he tried to kill me. I swear, he whacked me over the head, knocked me into the ocean, and left me for dead. This kid is really serious. He's a killer. What? said Randall T. Buckmeister from his luxurious New York office. What do you mean he tried to kill you? Are you insane? Why would he do that? Think about it, Randall, continued Wrench. It's the Choco Plums. Last thing I said to the kid was that I might get there first and beat him to it. It was a joke, Randall. I thought the whole thing was a joke until he attacked me. But now I'm thinking, it must be true. He knows where the Choco Plums are. Recently, he'd been thinking about nothing else, being knocked into the ocean and having to cling on to the end of a rope for three days and nights can have that effect on a person. 4,000 miles to the north, Randall put down his big smelly cigar in amazement. This is perfect, Max, he shouted excitedly, showing even less sympathy than Barbara had. If this is true, it's worth a fortune. We must beat him to it. Whatever you do, don't lose sight of him now. Wrench began to hurry through the crowd on his unsteady legs, barging holiday makers out of the way and craning his neck for a view of Finton. I see him, he hissed into his phone. He's with some older guy and they're getting into a cab. Excellent. Read me the license plate and I'll put some of our local guys right onto it. Wrench hurriedly dictated the taxi's number into his phone, then ended the call and stood swaying slightly from all the sudden exertion. Gradually, a mixture of dehydration, sunburn, hunger and exhaustion caught up with him. He wobbled a bit, went cross-eyed and fainted backwards onto the quayside. A few hundred yards away, Finton and Gribbley were pulling their odd assortment of luggage into the back of a taxi. Uh, Santos Colojo, town centre, hotel, please, driver, said Finton, whose knowledge of foreign language languages was about as poor as his knowledge of everything else. Understand the hotel The taxi driver stared blankly at him and shrugged. Gribbly decided he'd better help out. Allow me, sir, he said. Um hotel a grave no corresento de casa de Santa Cojola la por favor estacador. Which roughly translates as a nice hotel in Santos Colojo town centre. Please, driver. Ah, si, senor said the taxi driver, who seemed to have understood perfectly well as he drove off straight away in a cloud of dust. Vinton was thoroughly impressed and was just as confused. Good Lord, Gribbley, I didn't know you spoke Spanish. Gribbley smiled modestly. I took the precaution of bringing along a phrase book and it's not Spanish, sir, it's Portuguese. It's the language the inhabitants of Brazil speak. Really? Well, fancy that. Shouldn't they speak Brazilian or something? As it turned out, Gribbley had just enough time to explain a few hundred years of international history before the cab arrived in Santos Colajo town. They unloaded their belongings and checked into a small, whitewashed hotel without Finton breaking anything, which by his standards was a pretty good sign. Right, interesting turn of events there. So we've got the... Um, Max Wrench now is convinced that there really is the Brazilian Choco Plum. I wonder if there is. So, chapter 12. After a good night's sleep in proper beds with no seasickness, the intrepid explorers ate a hearty breakfast and prepared to start the next stage of their expedition. Master Finton, sir, said Gribbley tentatively as they walked down the stairs into the hotel lobby. Now that we're here, may I ask you intend to locate these precious fruits... Assuming, of course, they exist. They exist all right, Gribbs, Finton said confidently. They grow in the rainforest. It says so in Young Adventurer. He brandished a crumpled copy of his magazine, which he had brought with him for reference purposes. Indeed, continued Gribbley. But I understand the Brazilian rainforest forest to be rather large, sir, in the region of seven million square kilometres. Is it? replied Finton. He raised an eyebrow and whistled can't whistle. Wow, that's pretty big. Good job I bought my walking boots then. The thing is, you see, Gribbs, we need to find this old lady who was in the magazine article. She lives around here, say she saw them when she was a little girl, and knows exactly where they are. Gribbley looked at the photograph Finton was showing him, and his heart sank a little further. The woman looked about a hundred years old. Oh dear, he thought to himself, this is worrying. 
The poor old thing was probably completely mad. She either made it up or imagined it, and even if she was telling the truth, the last time she saw the trees was about 90 years ago. What are the chances that they'd still be there? He said nothing, but forced a fairly encouraging nod of the head. Vincent walked to the reception desk and rang the bell with a confident slap of the hand. The bell broke and rolled onto the floor with a loud clatter. Used, used to such little problems. Finton casually pushed it out of sight with his foot. After a moment, a receptionist arrived at the desk wearing a smart purple jacket, a little black moustache and a wide professional grin. Can I help you, senor? He beamed through his strong local accent. Ah, yes, please, said Finton, holding his magazine open at the Choco Plum article and pointing at the photograph of the old woman. I'm looking for the lady in this picture. She's called... Quarantina or something. I can't pronounce her second name at all, I'm afraid. The man produced his reading glasses from his top pocket, put them on and stared intently at the picture. Ah, yes, senor, he announced. Quarantina Cavalcanti. This lady is known to me. She very well known lady here in Santo Colo. Very good cook at Cafe Gudrosa in town. Five minutes walkings from here. Really? Brilliant, said Finton, amazed at how easy this was turning out to be. Do you think you could draw me a little map, please? Armed with, his encouraging inf armed with this encouraging information and a rough map scribbled on the back of the magazine, Finton and Gribbley walked out of the lobby into the street, leaving the receptionist looking at his desk and wondering where the bell had gone. The air outside was hot and thick and smelled of several things at once. Exotic blossoms, strange meaty things on sticks being sold by people from little cars, car exhaust fumes and overflowing rubbish bins being rummaged through by skinny stray dogs. Children in shorts and sandals were running around shouting excitedly. Car horns honked and church bells rang. Vinton thought it was brilliant. This is brilliant, Gribbs, he said, to demonstrate his point. We really are in a foreign country now, aren't we? Everything's different, and best of all, we know where to find Quarantina already. I've got a feeling this is going to be great. With Finton in charge of the map reading, they strode contentedly off in search of Café Gorderosa. Through narrow, noisy streets lined with banana trees and old, brightly coloured buildings with peeling paint, almost everything they saw was new, strange and amazing. They watched as gaudily painted buses struggled up steep hills, frightening the occasional chicken wandering around on the cobbles. They passed makeshift homes from made of corrugated iron and old packing cases with endless lines of washing hanging out in the sun. Neither of them, however, noticed when a man in dark glasses with a large black beard began to follow them. Whenever they stopped to check where they were, the man stopped too, leant against a wall and pretended to be reading his newspaper. Finton probably still wouldn't have noticed him, even if he'd been, even if he'd been wearing a large bright orange hat with spy written on it. Just over an hour later, Finton began to doubt whether the cafe really was only five minutes walkings away. Perhaps if you let me read the map, sir, suggested Gribbley. He was handed the crumpled magazine, which Finton had been rotating, trying to make sense of the simple directions. Once they'd retraced their steps for a while, they found themselves outside a small, tatty-looking building with old wrought iron balconies and crumbling reddish plaster. A hand-painted sign over the door read, Café Gudurosa. Aha! Here we are, then, announced Finton happily, and opened the door with his hopes high. The cafe was cramped, dimly lit and smelled strongly of strange spices. There were a handful of tables strewn with dirty plates and empty bottles and a crackly radio, radio was playing old-fashioned Latino music. Several elderly women in big hats were sitting in old wooden chairs arguing loudly with each other in Portuguese. When Finton and Gribbley walked in, the chatter abruptly stopped. Every eye in the place turned and stared at the strange-looking pair. An awkward silence fell broken, only by the distorted tune coming from the radio and a wonky old ceiling fan that creaked painfully above them. Finton looked like a small deer caught in the headlights of an oncoming truck. He smiled weakly and held up the picture of Quarantina Cavalaganti without saying a word or changing their distru distrustful expressions. Several of the old ladies pointed towards an open door that led to a dark, smoky kitchen. 
Both Gribbly and Finton nodded in mute understanding and quietly walked over to it. Finton called out an exploratory, Hello! and waited for a reply. From the dark kitchen they could hear what sounded like someone chopping through chunks of gristle with a large cleaver and things sizzling in pans. Eventually, the chopping noises stopped and a tiny, extremely wrinkly old woman appeared behind the counter. Her hair was white, wiry and as thin as candy floss. She was wearing the tattiest dress and the filthiest apron Finton had ever seen, neither of which appeared to have been anywhere near a washing machine in several years. She was clutching a large metal skewer on which was impaled a lump of raw red meat, dripping blood and grease onto the floor. She squinted at her two visitors, eyeing them up and down, as if they were aliens. It appeared she wasn't going to ask them what they wanted, so Gribbly coughed slightly and gestured for Finton to explain why they were there. Um, <clears throat> Mrs. Corentina, he began tentatively. You are Mrs. Corentina, yes? You lady in magazine? At this point, he thought it would be easier to spread his crumpled copy of Young Adventurer on the counter than to attempt what a magazine was. The old woman peered at the article through glassy-looking yellow eyes, and a flicker of understanding appeared on her face. Finton felt encouraged and stabbed his in index finger at his chest. Me? From England, he said very slowly and distinctly. Uh, me look for... Charcoal plum tree, performing a mime of what a tree looked like, st struck him as being a useful addition at this point, so he stretched his arms up like he remembered doing at nursery school. Quarantina still said nothing, but now stared at him, as if he weren't just an alien, but a very stupid alien. Where is yummy fruit? He went on, taking care to say each word very clearly, as if this wasn't enough. He intimidated. He imitated what he thought looked like someone eating through fruit, then rubbed his belly and made yummy noises. Gribbly stared at the floor, horribly embarrassed by this amateurish attempt at international communication. I'm not stupid, you know, said Quarantina suddenly. I do speak English. Finton looked extremely relieved. Oh, that's good then, he announced. Quarantina wiped her hands on the dirty apron and placed the dead thing on the counter. Come, she said, shuffling out into the cafe and pointing at a vacant table. We'd better talk. By now, the level of the voices in the cafe had turned to their precious, passionate pitch, so it looked like they would have to talk fairly loudly too. The three of them sat at a wooden table, which Quarantina wiped clear of unidentifiable crumbs and lumps with her wrinkled old hand. The cafe door opened again and a man in dark glasses with a huge bushy black beard strolled in without attracting any interest at all. He walked to the counter, ordered a strong coffee from a young spotty man who had appeared from the kitchen, then sat at the adjacent table and disappeared behind his newspaper. I should have known this would happen, said Quarantina. She shook her head sorrowfully. I shouldn't have said anything to that magazine reporter. We'll probably over be overrun with people now. Finton leant across the table and moved aside a wax-covered old bottle holding a stumpy candle so that he could talk more privately. Oh no, I shouldn't think so, he said. In fact, most people don't even believe the Choco Plum is real. I even met a man on the way here who laughed at me when I mentioned it. You needn't worry about people coming to bother you. You came, she said matter-of-factly. Ah, yes, good points, added Finton. I suppose I did, but I'm sure no one else will. The old woman became silent again, apparently not reassured, and looked sadly at the magazine article. So, continued Finton, putting on his best friendly voice, are you going to tell me where they are? I mean, please? Quarantine aside and looked dubious. I'm not sure I can do that, she said. What? Why? stammered Finton, suddenly horrified that his quest had reached a dead end. Don't you remember where they are? Of course I remember, snapped Quarantina. Like I said, I'm not stupid, but why should I trust you, eh? How do I know you won't take all the fruits away to your own country and spoil the forest with your big boots and your noisy chainsaws? You must understand that the Choco Plum Grove is a very special place for me. 
It's a secret place to my family, hidden in a beautiful tiny valley, hardly visited by anyone. My parents showed the grove to me when I was a little girl, and I saw the fruits growing there. Each year on my birthday, I was allowed to eat one. She paused for a moment, looked lost in a treasured memory. Why did I ever speak to that magazine reporter? It will only bring trouble. Gribbley had been listening to the sad old woman speaking with some astonishment. Much to his surprise, she wasn't as mad as a sack of frogs, as he'd been expecting, but sounded distinctly like she knew what she was talking about. This was quite a revelation. Even more amazingly, it also meant that Finton wasn't as daft as he'd thought either. That idea would take rather more getting used to. Madame Quarantina, he said, having decided he ought to help out a little, I can assure you that we have no intention of damaging the trees, or indeed of taking away all the fruit. We merely wish to acquire a small sample for planting. If the fruit can be grown in our own greenhouses, then it will be much less of a rarity, and no one will need to disturb your valley. Quarantina must have found Gribbley's words reassuring, because she suddenly looked a lot more comfortable. If I tell you of this secret place, you must promise me not to cut any of the trees down, or to pick the fruit, she said cautiously. Finton nodded, moved the stubby candle onto the next table and leant closer, eager to hear the secret location. After a little more thought, Quarantina decided she could trust them. At least she decided she could trust the nice grown-up one in the soup. My granddaughter Anna lives in a small village near the edge of the rainforest. A very long bus journey to the south. If you promise you will respect my wishes, I will arrange for her to show you the way. Finton's delight at hearing this news was interrupted by a sudden commotion from the next table, as the candle he'd just moved set fire to the bearded man's newspaper. The man let out a frightening shriek, then leapt up and flapped his burning paper in a futile attempt to extinguish it. The flames quickly spread to the man's black beard, which he hurriedly took off, threw to the floor and stamped on. This, and the nasty smell of burnt nylon in the air, led Finton to believe that it might have been a false one, a false beard. Sorry about that, said Finton awkwardly. I just sort of moved the candle a bit to be safe, and well, you know. The man didn't reply, but furiously adjusted his slightly melted sunglasses and stormed out into the street, leaving his newspaper and his fake beard smouldering away on the cafe floor. What a strange man, said Finton. Right, and that was chapter 12. A lot of lovely description in that one, actually, of the surroundings. A good one to model, pinch a bit of that description from. Right, I will leave it there. So that was chapters 10, 11 and 12. Bye for now.